much. Okay, thank you, Hannah. Um, so just a couple of quick uh, disclaimers from me at the start of this presentation. Obviously, um, I'm uh, going to express some views and opinions which are wholly mine. Um, so as the first uh, disclaimer says, uh, the, uh, the views and opinions expressed of the, uh, of the presenter, which is me. And then just a quick warranty about the uh, completeness and reliability accuracy of the, of the harvested information for the presentation. Uh, I'm not liable if you uh, do something crazy with it. So, okay. So, who am I and, and what am I doing here? So, my name my name is Dave Sharp. Um, my long background is with uh, within the uh, video games development industry. So, 23 years worth of experience of games design and development, programming. Um, games publishing, so I, I worked as a team member, development team member, but then I also worked in the publishing side of the business. I've done some hardware development uh, and latterly done some more kind of business orientated and project uh, investment work. Um, I would still regard myself as a technologist, so I still code uh, on a, pretty much on a daily basis. Um, the things I'm interested in change over time, but currently that would that list there looks um, pretty uh, accurate as to the things that I've got going on uh, at the moment, particularly with things like blockchain and um, machine-based learning. Um, I guess I am an entrepreneur, so I've, I've been involved in, in three or four different startups directly. So those are the ones listed there, Real Rider, Tap SOS, and Tribuco. But in a secondary way, I've been involved in another 20 or so, either providing advice or technical support or uh, business development um, input. I do work as a consultant. Uh, I, I've done consultancy for about 40 companies, but there's a small snapshot there of the kinds of companies that I work with. Um, I do IT due diligence. So uh, this is work done on behalf of uh, venture capitalist investment. So they'll ring me up and tell me that they've seen something that they like, but they don't know what's going on underneath the hood. And I'll write a detailed report about the uh, technical side of things, software, uh, infrastructure, that kind of thing. Um, and I've done about 150 of those. Uh, and this is my academic, academic input. So I do uh, have a fairly wide spread of uh, kind of connectivity in and out of academia. Um, Mostly with Scottish Qualification Authority, so I do a lot of work for them on on course development, qualification development, uh, and then secondly with Durham uh, Durham University Business School. So I teach on the MBA and the Mini MBA um, at Durham. Uh, but you can see there's a there's a bunch of different kinds of um, organisations there, educational organisations, and I'm literally just about to start work with NCFE on the implementation of T levels. So what is this presentation about? So I was kindly asked to look at um, industry and academic partnerships. Uh, what are they? How do they? How do they look? What do they sound like? Um, and uh, what, under what conditions do they work? You know, is, is there an ideal model for that kind of collaboration? Um, why do they not work? You know, is there some uh, cause and effect that will that'll stop a partnership from working. Um, so we're going to take a look at where we find ourselves today. What you know, what does it actually look like in the in the here and now? Um, what does academia actually look, look like from from an industry perspective? Um, and then conversely, what does industry look like to the academic sector? Uh, what goes wrong? So, as with all things, we learn far more from when it doesn't, when things don't work, from when they do work. So, I'm going to focus a little bit on what actually stops them from working in an attempt to uh, highlight the core issues. Um, uh, a new interaction type is needed, as you'll see throughout the presentation. There's there's lots of reasons why the current kind of approach to these things is not great. 
and, and I'm going to speculate a little bit on what a new interaction type between industry and academia might look like. Um, it's a little less than scientific, but I think it's got a, a firm kind of basis. And then I've got some suggestions, just things that just stand out, you know, as I've gone around and looked at uh, a lot of things in the run up to doing this presentation. There are some things that really do just leap out at you in terms of why uh, the, this, the, the kind of tussle between academia and industry continues. So I've tried to encapsulate those into some suggestions that um, you could take and use and hopefully it would wouldn't it wouldn't remove the problems completely but it would certainly uh, lessen them so that's what we're going to cover so I've tried to get the problem in a nutshell and this this is actually really quite hard so as much as I sat and thought that I understood what some of the issues are on both sides of the equation for academia and for industry trying to get it into a single sentence or trying to get it to a uh, to a smaller body of text was actually really quite difficult but I did like this so if the goal is to climb a tree industry is trying to hire a squirrel and academia is trying to train a horse um, it's a phrase I had seen previously and hadn't really contemplated what it meant in any great sense but it does really sum the problem up so we've got an industry faction that is uh, under pressure, high tempo, uh, fail fast, move on. So the goal in terms of climbing a tree, it would just want to hire the thing that would just climb the tree. It would just go for the squirrel uh, and, you know, right tool for the job, supposedly, and the squirrel would just climb the tree. Um, and academia is obviously not about that. So it's about uh, the idea that... Um, uh, people can be educated to overcome almost anything, I guess. If the right education is applied to the right person, you'll you'll get an outcome. Um, so as much as I tried, I tried to write other bits of text that would uh, encapsulate the problem. But I think that statement actually does do it. You know, it does set out the uh, the, the the bigger picture and the bigger notion that um, there's two ways of looking at. At everything I guess and you know industry and academia are, are looking at that the goal is to climb a tree and have two very different uh, ideas about what that uh, what the solutions to that would look like so obviously the background to this is is quite diverse so routes for funding are just disappearing for, for academics so it's not you know it's not the heyday when the, the government uh, or public sector funding would cover a, a large range of uh, of academia's requirements. Um, a lot of that money now, or the, or the money that does exist, it is flowing into a very narrow set of um, subjects and topics, which means that if you're not in that in that shortlist, uh, if you're an academic not working in those fields, um, it's a real problem to then work out where the funding would come from. Um, there was lots of published information that I read, but pretty much it just came down to if you're trying to advance, you know, engineering and uh, medicine and that kind of thing, you're far more likely biotech. You're far more likely to find some funding than, than if, you, if you're in the arts or social sciences or something. Um, and that's obviously um, a, a large part of the issue for the academic community is, is what's happened to the funding kind of um, uh, what's happening to the funding kind of uh, environment um, for the industry point of view it's uh, things just get quicker and quicker so probably back in the 70s any large company uh, probably had months if not years to work on new product development and uh, new services um, the way with the way that things are heading now with industry 4.0 and and digital particularly is that industry is finding that uh, product cycles just get shorter and shorter so um, you know putting two or three years worth of effort and money into something where the uh, the uh, the context might have changed three or four times in that period is just a gamble and um, and probably you know a a gamble too far for, for many companies so 
the rate of change and the pace of change, the increased pressure to get uh, new products and services into the market, it, it doesn't really underpin the whole notion of research and, and long-term relationships with um, with the universities. So for the industry, they've just got to find shorter, quicker, more rapid um, solutions. So we, the next thing that I think stood out really was the uh, cultural differences between uh, what is a modern university and what is a modern company. Um, there's obviously some um, uh, philosophical kind of points or, or, or things that um, academics really subscribe to, um, long-standing views and, and approaches and um, I guess ideologies about what uh, academia, academia represents and why it's there and, and who it's for. Um, and you know, you can take an almost opposite stance with industry and therefore we've got this gulf with this kind of gap between uh, the culture you're going to find in a modern, forward-looking, progressive uh, industrial company, and what happens in academia. And in a lot of uh, in a lot of the things I reviewed as, as part of the run-up to this presentation, um, culture becomes the, the first or the second thing most commonly quoted as uh, creating difficulty between academia and um, and universities. Um, and the phrase I've got there, you know, one is trying to gain recognition, the other is trying to gain profits, is a really kind of good way of, of analogizing that, that difference. Um, and then next up was a, 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 a point about language. So, um, and I, I've experienced this, you know, myself, where I've been sat in meetings, I, I've got this kind of this work life now that will quite often leave me in the same room as business people and academic people at the same time. Um, but language is a, is a barrier. It's a, uh, academics and, and industry people do talk about the same subjects with grossly different um, phrase, phraseology and wording. Um, sometimes it's difficult to know they are talking about the same thing, but they are talking about the same thing, they're just doing it differently. Um, and, and the implications of the way that words are used is completely different. So, you know, as I've quoted there, I had some real odd moments when um, I've used the phrase or, or I've understood the phrase to be right away, meaning in, in the very short term, to have an academic tell me that that's not how he understands the term right away. Um, and other, other, other words, common words, you know, like quality, uh, when is something actually finished? Um, it's it's a it's a gap. There's a gap there between um, how these words and phrases and and the meaning of them is used in both industry and academia, and it's just another it's just another barrier. It's just another lip to get over uh, when you're trying to put two these two kind of um, uh, these two groups of people together. Um, and the last thing is to do with really I couldn't I couldn't find a, a better way. I couldn't think of a different way of phrasing this, but there is some prejudices around. It's it's uh, it's still um, it's still common to have somebody say something which is essentially not true, and is and is prejudicial against the person that they're describing. Um, uh, I, I have had a couple of academics use that word purity when it comes to research, and they don't like um, they don't like the idea that commercialism is going to have an effect on what they're doing, and then um, you know. Conversely, business people saying, well, every time we try and work with an academic, all they do is ignore us and they don't want to change and they don't want to. So those are, those old prejudices are still there. So if we take this as a list, um, it's quite, a, it's the top five. It, it would be the top five things for me having done research ahead of this uh, presentation. And all those are very, very common themes when you're looking at what's gone on previously. Um, in the kind of academic industry partnership uh, model. So, kind of, where do we find ourselves today? Um, this diagram, I think, has a gives a good kind of view. So, from the industry expectation side, there's still um, a constant. Uh, expectation that uh, courses are training people for employment. So 
I've used the phrase industry ready courses, but what I really mean is um, courses that are aimed at putting somebody uh, into a position to actually execute something rather than critique something or describe something. Um, so industry ready courses, um, and particularly for, for what I do for a living in terms of software development, um, you, you do want practitioners, you need, you know, your expectation is that somebody that spent three or four years studying something can actually execute uh, what they've learned. Um, we, you know, we all, you know, from an industry point of view, we all want kind of develop manpower. I'm being, going to be a bit partisan here because obviously I sit probably closer to the industry point of view than the academic one. But that's what we, that's what we want. We want uh, people to come to us from the university with um, that have developed over over the period that they've been there um, and can um, affect the business positively almost from day one. Um, rather than having to go through a, a, a period of bringing them up to um, industry standards, uh, which is probably actually a, a, an unrealistic expectation, but I think that expectation is there. Um, we want solutions for problems. With you know, uh, industry uh, companies are generally sitting there with a long list of long wish list of you know solutions they wish they had for various issues, um, and it would still be one of the kind of top industry expectations. And then. Um, a pragmatic approach. We want we want academia to be as uh, have the same kind of tempo and the same kind of velocity that that, that the uh, a private sector company would. Again, probably actually unrealistic in in lots of ways, but it would still be a fairly common industry expectation that there is some pragmatism. When I started to look at the academic expectations, um, I had to draw on. Um, some colleagues, people that I work with frequently, um, but also um, looking at um, uh, my personal experiences, if you like, of watching academics uh, in these kind of scenarios. Um, but as per the previous slide, there's such a such a downward pressure on academics to find that that missing bit of funding or find that partner that can offset the cost of, of doing the work um, that. A lot of academics join the conversation in terms of, of a collaboration of a partnership, and funding is, is very key. Clearly, either number one or number two on their on their kind of expect, list of expectations. Um, long gone are the days where um, you know uh, this kind of thing was going to get funded by somewhere else. So they've got to keep that very keenly in mind now. Um, they expect to be equal partners. I think um, I think that's a very uh, Obvious, almost obvious thing to say, but sometimes it's not quite as clear as it as it could be. Um, so I think it's a it's a valid it's a valid expectation on behalf of academia to be seen as equal in the in the relationship. Um, but when I, when I've gone and looked at some things in the preparation for this talk, it wasn't always the case. So it was at, at times it could be seen that the that the academic um, uh, side of the relationship wasn't 50-50. They, they were relegated down a little bit from that. But I think it's it's a reasonable expectation now for academia to be seen as 50-50 and equal partners. Uh, obviously, what they want is placements. Um, I think that's uh, uh, an obvious and um, common kind of um, expectation. Placements is, is vital for students. It improves the relationship. Um, and the standing of the university overall with prospective students, um, re uh, student recruitment then you know drives new revenue and all that kind of stuff. So um, I think that was a that was a fairly common kind of comment that I got. And then an achievable goal. Now this this was actually slightly harder to comprehend. So a couple of academics had said to me that they felt that sometimes the industry expectation didn't leave them. With an achievable goal, it was so either vague, indistinct, or borderline impossible that the that the academic um, kind of view on it was that there was no achievable goal in the discussion. So now I think that is a is a key or primary factor for academic expectations that there is absolutely something that they can achieve that's clearly defined, well described, and feasible. Um, as part of that um, relationship. So if we look, if we put some statements alongside this diagram, so 
Um, uh, industry is very good at finding problems worth solving. Academia is is looking for problems to solve. Um, it's a you know a common sentiment. I think um, uh, it's it's very true. I think industry is very good at finding you know and highlighting and identifying things that could be done better, differently, to a different standard, through a different route. Um, and academia is really geared up to solve that. You know that's that's kind of what they do. Take the problem, un unpack it diagnose it, contemplate it, think, you know, uh, think of a, a, a way forward, test that way forward, generate the proof or the evidence. So I think it's, um, I think it's a, it's a valid statement. I think that's, that's perfectly true. Um, public sector funding gets rarer. So of course, um, the next best opportunity for universities is to create those commercial collaborations where uh, companies that are cash flow positive and have money to invest can invest it with the university for the benefit of them and that university. I think that's um, valid. Um, for the companies, you know, talent acquisition, we're in the middle of a skills crisis really in, in lots of sectors. Um, if I think about particularly software development, uh, you know, we're uh, thousands, tens of thousands of software engineers short in, in the UK in general. Um, so finding that talent, if you're a, if you're an industry company now, is stupidly expensive. If you've got to go through rec recruitment companies and very very long winded to get the right kind of people, whereas a relationship with the university should be a working relationship with the university should be a much better, easier, cleaner way of finding that talent talent at a much earlier stage, and then kind of nurturing it along with the university. Um, both parties benefit reputationally. Um, if you Google, you know, if you do the whole Google thing, you'll find very strong PR and um, reputational kind of value in uh, standing side by side with, you know, uh, industry industry standing side by side with academia. Uh, and I've got some references and case studies further in the presentation just to highlight a couple of things that I read, which I thought were really good examples. Um, but there is a benefit there for both the, the, the industry partner and the university to. Um, to uh, collaborate and uh, share that social media or that or that um, uplift in recognition. Um, universities have the opportunity to create conduits for inter industry for students. Um, obviously, um, employment is the is the end goal of going to university. Students want to have a good choice of uh, of companies and and jobs and roles to choose from. Um, and you know any any collaboration between uh, a private sector and university should end up with uh, those conduits in place. Um, the companies get the benefit of the real specialist knowledge that they'd never really afford to have on staff. Um, so if you need a, a a computer scientist to look at um, uh, the development of of um, a KPI or a metric or an, a, a, do some analytics or anything like that. For a lot of companies, that specialist knowledge and understanding um, isn't available to them. Uh, they either can't afford to hire it or it just isn't. It just doesn't exist. So taking those kinds of things to the universities is is a clear benefit to be able to go to them and say, "We have a skills gap. This is what we need. Can you help?" So. If I just go back, if that list really, uh, if you take that list in its totality, there's lots of good reasons, positive reasons there to get this right, to, to have a, a working relationship between a company and a university. There's a lot to be gained by that. Uh, it should be quite advantageous for both parties if it's done correctly. Um, and, you know, it should be part of the, the strategy, the inherent strategy of both of those elements, both academia and industry should have a uh, something in their core strategy which relates to, to the other party. Um, I suspect that universities do a little bit better with that. I think they've got more of a mind about uh, what's going on in the industry and I think a lot of industry companies come to academia uh, late or very low down on a list. So I think there's some good reasons there to get this right if uh, if you can do the if you can do the dating bit and get the right university involved with the right commercial company, I don't see why. Uh, a lot of that list couldn't be realised. 
So what does academia look like if, from an industry perspective? Um, so um, what I did is just take some personal experiences and top them up with, with uh, some conversations with people who I knew had a, uh, uh, a certain set of experiences. Um, there are a lot of industry people that have a bit of a low starting point when it comes to academia because largely uh, early stage interactions have been about money. Um, and of course, they can all read for themselves that acad academia is in that kind of vein now where it needs to create new sources of, of research funding and, and, and revenue. Um, so there are a lot of industry people that would just say, well, the only time they ever come near us is when they want money. Now, that's a bit, you know, I don't, I don't fully kind of subscribe to that. Um, but it is a, it is a, it is a thing for a lot of uh, industry people that, um, that they're just seen as kind of uh, a point of access into um, money. Um, slow, very slow. I, I've I've had this myself, where you know academics running on different kinds of principles in terms of the passage of time, having to mix in all sorts of different activities between teaching and research and PhD supervision and sabbaticals and book writing and publications, and somewhere in there they've got to try and keep a, a set of interactions running. Um, and then th those interactions tend to be fairly low down on the list. Um, so it, 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 it is a thing for, for uh, industry companies that uh, a lot of their experiences of, of, a, of a, an interaction with the university where somebody says, hey, we'll get in touch. And then when, when the actual uh, contact's made, it's, it's weeks or months later rather than hours and days. So there's a thing there about the tempo between academia and, uh, and industry. Um, I couldn't think of a better phrase for this. I wrote overthought, over-engineered, um, and I've definitely had this. So um, as industry changes, and particularly in digital, where things just get quicker and quicker and quicker, um, we've developed the, the conceptual ideas about things like minimum viable product, where we're just going to engineer something until uh, the first person can use it, and then we're going to uh, launch it on that and let, let a few people use it, learn some stuff, come back, change it, do it again. Um, to then try and involve uh, an academic institution or an academic in that process is really, really difficult. So uh, there's a real mismatch there of um, uh, the, the industrial kind of point of view where uh, we're going to innovate really quickly, we're going to fail fast, we're going to learn some one thing, we're going to do it all again. And then you've got an academic that's looking two years down the line at what can be achieved if every I is dotted and every T is crossed. Um, it's very, very difficult to get um, that to kind of align itself properly. Um, and it's not it's not a, a negative on academia. It's just how academia is. And it, but it's one of the biggest um, one of the biggest challenges I think is uh, is that uh, is overcoming that mismatch. Um, highly theoretical, lacking application. So it is still true that you can meet a, a graduate who talks well, who interviews well, who can discuss and debate and describe the thing that they've been studying, and then at the last step uh, can't apply it in the way that the company would like. So there was a, if I go back to my game development uh, era, um, it was common to meet um, students that had done things like games design or game um, art creation. Um, and particularly with the art creation, they talk well about uh, the concepts of creating art and 3D modeling and texturing and all that kind of stuff. And then just couldn't quite apply it in the way that they described. So there was a, a slightly um, uh, odd phrase that you would hear from time, time, time to time saying, you know, that universities are creating art historians, but but nobody that can paint. And with some sectors, things are a lot better. So if I jump forward 10, 12 years now with games development, uh, the courses have become much more practical, much more uh, about applic applying what they're learning and not just reading about it. And that's obviously to the benefit of both the games industry and the university. Um, but it is still a case that you can meet students who really do lack the ability to apply what they've learned, and that is a, a commonly held industry kind of view that that that, that is still um, 
that is still in 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 the in the kind of uh, in the environment. And then low confidentiality. So um, by its very nature, uni universities are uh, publishers. It's what they do. So they take everything that they've done, uh, contextualize it for the audience, write it, refine it, and publish it. And of course, they have a lot on the, they have a lot on the line with that. So the way that that they are critiqued, ranked, reputation, academic standing, it's about the publishing of those research documents and findings. But from an industry point of view, that's a problem. You know, if they're if they're working towards something that they think is significant in terms of IP, potentially a patent or a trade secret, um, that's the last thing that they actually want. They actually don't want that, that stuff being put into the public domain because it negates the idea or it negates the option of, of creating a patent or a trade secret. So these were things that were given to things that I'd either experienced myself or points that were given to me over the last couple of couple of weeks while I've been chatting with people. Um, I'm not I'm not fully convinced of any or all of those is is empirically true, but it, it is still there out in the in the industry kind of conversation. If you bring up academia, somebody's going to reference one of those five things probably as being uh, a point of view. So what does the industry look like to the academic sector? This is obviously much harder for me to quantify because I'm genuinely not an academic. So I had to rely a lot more on uh, people that I um, have either had some experience with or are currently working with to work out what that might look like. So as with the last slide, it can be just about the money. So uh, industry and commercial uh, ideas about um, uh, what happens to um, the commercialization of work that's co that comes out of these um, collaborations is uh, variable. So and ac academics will often, or a couple of academics have said there's too much uh, impetus and too much momentum and too much um, weight placed on um, commercializing the work, um, even at, at a point where it's not deemed as finished. Um, and that makes the industry people look a little bit more money money oriented than maybe some of them are, um, and you know it makes the the academic at times you know I, you can see some real discomfort with academics when um, you bring up the subject of commercialising what they do. Um, but from a from an academic point of view, looking at what industry is doing, uh, it does it can quite often be seen as this is just about getting us to the point where the first bit of money can be made and then they, then that's the first thing that they're going to try and do. Um, so, so chaotic. Um, it is true that lots of, um, lots of uh, um, commercial companies and particularly anything that's small in nature or has come through some startup process, it really doesn't have a lot of structure to it and a lot of discipline and, you know, People don't have a single uh, job identity or a job role, and they are doing everything that need, needs to be done that day, and tomorrow they'll be doing something different. So it can look uh, like it's out of control. It can feel like it's it's really random. Um, and if you compare that to the way that universities are structured and the strict adherence to the kind of chain of command and everybody's got a, a, a role that's kind of clearly understood. They belong to a faculty or they belong to a department. So they stick to that. You, you wouldn't get somebody from the School of Business in, you know, necessarily um, involving themselves with, you know, School of Health or history. So that, that cross collateralization is, is not common for, uh, for an academic, but it's highly likely for a lot of uh, industry um, companies and people. And it can look a little uh, less than organized. Um, they don't respect the science, which was um, a phrase somebody used uh, uh, recently. And I couldn't think of a way of summarizing it any better. It's literally that. They don't respect the science. So I think what the person was trying to tell me was that the, um, the, the academic approach to something is, is very uh, prescriptive. It's very regimented. They go to a lot of effort and diligence to make sure that what they end up with at the end is, is as correct as they can make it. And then somebody takes what they've done and uses it in a very 
avant-garde way or a very uh, almost uncaring way once it hits the commercial or the industry partner. Um, and I think it's, you know, if, um, if an academic uh, does a solid piece of work internally and it's, it's presented to other academics, there's a certain response that they're looking for. Uh, and when they don't get it from the industry partner, it's, a, it's almost like a lack of respect. So I'll stick with the phrase, they don't respect the science, and I'll, I'll, that's how I've kind of tried to interpret that. Um, so the goals are constantly shifting. Um, they constantly move. It's very, very common for a, a plan inside of a, an, a, an industry company to sometimes not survive more than a couple of weeks before it's changed, and then it changes again. And again, completely at odds with the way that academia would uh, orientate itself. So it's a it's a it's a phrase. It's a comment I've had a couple of times where I've had an academic said, you know, every time we have a meeting, they've they've changed what we're trying to do. Um, I, I understand the frustration there. I can see what the what the academic thinks about that. It's really not what they're geared up for. It's not how they have been effectively trained to behave. It's not what they uh, thought they were getting themselves into. There's lots of very disruptive things about um, this constantly changing set of requirements. Um, industry companies quite often talk about pivoting or the pivot. The thing is that they can pivot every day. In, in essence, they could change what they're doing literally every day. And that's kind of challenging for an academic um, in these relationships. Um, and they don't understand the rigor, which I think is a, something that I probably fell foul of going back to when I first started to get involved with academics. So this whole notion that their work is going to be peer reviewed and criticized and pushed and pulled and referenced and challenged and, you know, so it's probably unless you're a, unless you're a, a lifelong academic or you've committed yourself to that kind of environment uh, for a lot of industry people, they wouldn't understand any of that, I don't think. And it is, I understand it's to do with academic integrity. I understand that completely. Um, uh, and I think a lot of industry people pay, pay little or no attention. So every time the academic goes to uh, goes to his peers and says, this is what we've done, this is how we've done it, he's basically saying, criticize me, try and tell me that I'm wrong, try and prove me that I'm wrong, try and you know find something in what I've done that's not quite right. Um, and I think you know from the industry point of view, it's, uh, it's difficult to understand that, I think. That the, that the academic is going to behave in a certain is often going to behave in a certain way, knowing that there is going to be a peer review, and the and the industry partner doesn't really see or understand why that might be the case, or, or what the implications of that are. So I thought I'd chuck in a couple of quotes at this point, um, things that I kind of came across, or one that I came across. Uh, so this one, I'd not seen this until I started doing the research for this presentation, but I thought it was a good quote. Um, this idea that, you know, universities need to go out and discover other humans that, that can benefit from the work that they do. Um, I think uh, Susan Desmond Hillman is highly, you know, qualified enough to make that statement. I think she's probably got enough behind her to know what she's talking about there. Um, and I thought it was a good kind of quote. Um, the second quote I'm going to check out, I've seen before um, uh, a few times, um, this, this idea that industry and academia are like oil and water. I've seen it described the same but different in a few different places, but uh, Dr. Mark Ebers of, of Cologne University, I thought I'd got a good way, of, a good kind of couple of sentences there, um, which I think, you know, reflects some of the things I've had on the, on the previous couple of slides. Um, you know, universities struggle to find those acceptable routes through to um, the people in industry that are the most likely to understand who they are, how how they are, and, and what the what the kind of regime needs to be. Um, but you know, Dr. Mark Ebers there clearly accepting that they start off apart, uh, quite a far apart as as oil and water do. So. So as I said at the beginning, what I thought I'd do is I'm going to try and focus a little bit on, on how these things unravel because we tend to learn a little bit more from that as, than we do from just looking at successes. So um, I looked at a number of different projects um, that people described as uh, 
where the outcomes were not uh, as good as they expected or, or things just didn't didn't actually make it to the end of the project for, for a number of reasons. Um, having had to manage large projects, sometimes including three to 400 people in different time zones, I, I actually know what it's like when you just don't take care of all the all the simple stuff. So, you know, there is just a bunch of things that make relationships and projects uh, kind of function. And it's clear that having looked at some of the things, some of the projects that people quoted as not quite successful, there is a strong theme of just not taking care of all the little things at the beginning. So projects that started without a, a scope or the scope was incomplete, no documentation to support decision making and, and rationale, uh, no contracts, no none of the kind of biggie, none of the bigger kind of issues that crop up just dealt with at the beginning. So they just set off. There's a bit of enthusiasm at the beginning to get going, so they just get going, assuming that they'll jump these hurdles as they go. But in the end, um, having not taken care of them at the start is really what 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 brings them down. So there is just an unavoidable pre-production part of any project where you sit down and look at all the risks and all the unknowns and you deal with those before you just uh, put a spade in the ground and there were there were a lot of there was a lot of evidence there that academic industry partnership projects were not run on that basis they were uh, just too quick to put into uh, into action and, and not take care of all the, the nuts and bolts um, so intellectual properties is clearly a a, a thing, it's clearly a thing in 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 separation and togetherness in terms of the project. So, um, uh, academia has a very um, clear kind of stance, if you like, or idea about uh, what IP is, what it does, and who has the rights. But it's just completely different from what an intellect what intellectual property means to a private company. Um, and you know, it's just about you know who owns it and at what point does it become exploited or exploitable um, and all this stuff is actually not rocket science it's not complex law it's not that there isn't enough previous examples to show you what can and can't kind of go right and go wrong it just it tends to get ignored it's just left until uh, there's a problem or there's a potential problem before it's addressed and it really needs to be done differently it really needs to be um, almost researched in its own right and then described and uh, a, a kind of um, a rationale placed against you know who owns what why and how is it controlled and when can it be exploited it just should be dealt with as a completely separate kind of entity of any any collaboration and it should be done very very early so budgets um, uh, budgeting for uh, a, a university is, is a well thought out uh, kind of very sound set of accounting principles. So you've got direct costs and indirect costs that are that are dealt with separately. Um, when that's applied to a commercial partner, what it's clear is that the the way that the indirect costs is uh, rated and calculated can be a bit of a shock almost to the industry partner. So uh, had one person said had said to me, it just feels like we're paying for um, some of the things that the university should be paying for itself, like we're, we're somehow supporting some of their um, overheads. Um, it's a, it is a it's a thing and not a thing. And so I, I think I think with a lot of these things, it's just we, we know it's a problem, so it should just be um, done. It should be just uh, dealt with it very early in the project. Um, I think academia could help a little bit by having a slightly more um, transparent or slightly more uh, easy easy to understand way of explaining how they've worked out those costs uh, I don't think the industry industry people are stupid I think it's just that they're unaware of how that academic process might work um, but other than that it, it does become it does seem to appear to be a problem when I'm looking when I was looking at projects that didn't really run very well um, uh, quite often the industry partner felt that it was an expense that uh, there was some expense in there that they weren't really that they weren't really expecting to have to uh, to cover, and and then expectations. So just actually telling each party, telling the other what their expectations was, just never seems to happen. Or if it does, it's done in a way where each party walks away not really fully understanding what what they've been told. Um, 
So it's a common theme. It's a very common theme in a lot of the postmortems and a lot of the conversations I had where somebody said, well, you know, at the beginning we thought it was one thing, but halfway through we realized it's something else. And then we're in a bit of a problem because we don't agree and we, you know, that kind of thing. So m many projects, a lot of the projects just suffered from a lack of clarity from both partners. And then small issues at the beginning are, are, are just like amplified as the project carries on and then they kind of hit the mid mid part of the project and, and the cracks are appearing in terms of what people are expecting. Um, and obviously industry industry expectat expectations as we saw on the on the uh, the chart that I used earlier, they they can be a little harsh and a little bit unrealistic about what you, what academia can actually produce and and, and manage. Um, but it still occurs to me that a conversation or conversations to to bridge that um, bridge those points should have been held and could could have been held and would have probably you know some of these projects that didn't quite work out probably would have survived um, if that had been the case. Um, the communication. Um, we all use kind of words differently, and after the, you know the little bit of kind of hype at the beginning of the project, it would appear that everybody retreats to their um, their little silos and starts get gets going on what the project requires. Um, but the the way that the the communication works after that initial blast of euphoria is very very variable and generally leads to um, unresolved problems and issues just occurring further down the line. Um, Large, you know, multidisciplinary projects with different partners providing different um, input. Um, it's a complex set of communications that needs mapping out. So you probably create a communication strategy or a communications thesis at the beginning, and map out all the partners and resolve how each partner is going to communicate with each other partner, by what method and on what timetable. That to me, this can sound a bit like I'm saying really obvious things. But I actually was missing a lot of the time. I couldn't see what the communication protocol would have been uh, between the partners. And then as I'm looking at some of the postmortems, it becomes clear that there's actually so little communication between uh, partners at times. It was inevitable that the, that the whole project was going to kind of derail itself just for, for the lack of uh, dealing with each other in, the, in a co kind of correct manner. So a lack of political will. Um, there was clearly points at time, at, uh, points in time when looking at some of these projects where uh, senior management on either side of the equation would uh, parachute into something, not really understanding what they'd committed to, how they'd committed to it, what it was costing, what the timeline was, and who was involved. Which seems a little crazy that you can end up in a commercial relationship with another organisation and somebody in the top uh, echelons of those organizations doesn't really know that that's what they've done um, so it's you know the lack of political will and um, the kind of buy-in by uh, senior execs on on any level is kind of just fundamental um, uh, c-suite in um, in commercial organizations um, probably a little more uh, forthcoming but the route through to the senior execs in a university looks a little more convoluted so on this particular point, it's probably a little more difficult for the academic partner to see how that this, how this gets gets resolved. Um, but it's very definitely a theme within some of the um, some of the postmortems. Uh, politics and ego. I don't I don't really want to dwell on this. Uh, my experience is that academia is, is absolutely rife with politics. You you know a lot of conversations that I, I sit through, we're not really discussing something that isn't related to some form of uh, politics within the organization whether it's faculties schools you know that kind of thing um, it just needs to it just needs to be acknowledged that if it's allowed to proliferate it will kill the project really really quickly you know the soon as soon as politics and ego kick in it, it can be the death knell but a lack of leadership um, leadership the word leadership can obviously mean lots of different things in different contexts and with different audiences um, I, I mean I think I mean decision making or a decision maker so lots of things are allowed to go around and round and round in circles without somebody grasp, grasping hold of the nettle and saying right we're gonna we're gonna do something else or we're gonna do something to progress this or we're gonna do something that m makes this problem um, 
solvable. Um, a lack of leadership is probably a common theme through lots of the projects I looked at where there was uh, a points in time where projects reach, reach almost a, a point of paralysis because there is no fundamental leadership or decision making going on in, in any of the parties. It's not a, it's not something that belongs in one camp or the other. It's it's right through. So culture, uh, I spend a lot of my time in universities. I understand what they look and sound like, how they feel. Um, the people that are that are drawn to that environment, what they look like, how they sound, what they what they think they're there for, what they think they're not there for, um, what the motivations are. Um, it is possible that to sit there and, and, and see these things as complete opposites at times. So the people that went into academia were look, were searching on, on a on a voyage or on a on a on a journey towards one thing, and the people that gravitated towards business clearly on, on a completely different mission. Um, but it is uh, it does it does have a, a or it can have a quite a negative effect on on bringing these two groups together that the cultures don't line up and that uh, the people on either side of that equation don't really understand or recognize the other group for who they are, how they are and, and why they're doing what they're doing. So we're going to come back to communication again. So um, I'm going to come back to communication because this is my second point and it's to do with taxonomy or the use of words. So what I've really learned actually in the last couple of weeks is how diverse the taxonomy is in terms of uh, industry using the same word as an academic word, but the two of them think that they're talking about two completely different things. And then the background to that is, is really quite different ontologies underneath the taxonomies. So it would occur to me now that at the start of any project where you've got two diverse groups of people who came into two different, who came into it from two completely different starting points, that the first thing you would do is just sort out the language. So when we say milestone, what do we mean? When we say deadline, what do we mean? When we say finished, what do we mean? When we say quality, what do we mean? So it would occur to me now that that actually would be a very practical and pragmatic step that any uh, project could take to really sort out some of the misunderstandings and, and miscommunications that, that clearly go on when one body is trying to tell the other body something of some importance but chooses to do it in a in a way that they that they is unrecognizable uh, even though they, they think they're using the right words just as a point mile, milestone and deadline so the the example i would give you is um uh, milestone it belongs to one community and deadline belongs to the other so they're actually the same thing in reality they are the same thing but they are treated separately as two different things across industry and academia so i think so this is where i get to the dave sharp hypothesis so i think a new interaction type is needed i think there's a, there's a new formula for for bringing these two parties together but the question then would be what what would it look like and and i've I've had a couple of goals now at trying to work out how to describe this um, and this is what I've got but just for the purpose of completeness I'm just going to quickly identify uh, this the standard or the most common things you might find already just in case anybody isn't overly familiar with them so strategic partnerships is the most common thing uh, the most common uh, goal between an academic institution and an industry partner is something called a strategic partnership. Um, to me, and looking at how they use, they are definitely long-term, getting to bed with each other, kind of relationships. Um, you know, five to ten years possibly, and and quite uh, more rather than uh, specific outcomes in in kind of tight scopes, more of a flexible framework kind of agreement to wander around a few issues to see uh, what can be achieved and then um, take all the time that's required to to to, to deliver those um, to deliver those insights and, and new knowledge um, underneath that we've probably got something called an operational partnership so it's more of a medium term thing and it really uh, probably three to five years something like that 
Um, and it really revolves around um, a, an identified research project. So a single question with a single answer is how I would, I would describe it. Um, um, when I was looking at kind of how these were used, Bosch in Germany seemed to do a lot of operational partnerships and seemed to be pretty good at it. So picking off specific individual um, kind of issues and then going to the right university with the right question to get the right answer. And then underneath that is more of a transactional relationship or a transactional partnership. That's kind of where, kind of where, I guess, where I fit in. So quite often I'll come in as a practitioner and do some teaching in a class to show how industry would apply something that the class has been learning potentially theoretically. Um, I, I guess that's the one that I would be most familiar with in the, in that column. Um, so these are the three things that you're most likely, these are the three interaction types that you're most likely to find because these, there's plenty of evidence to show that the universities have engaged in these, that they've had varying degrees of successes and, and that kind of thing. Um, this table was a good kind of roundup of that. So there's some uh, uh, interaction types down the left. So in the format, you could have like an embedded individual. And there's an example there of MIT's Microsystems Technology Lab. Um, the one I would call your attention to is the fifth one down, student hackathons. So these are a fairly recent phenomenon. A hackathon, if you're not familiar with it, is um, a collection of people trying to solve uh, a particular problem in a very short, intense period of time, usually two or three days. Um, so the industry partner will come in and say, um, you know, we've got a question around, um, you know, maintenance or something. And then students will come in and take data sets and try and analyze that data to see if they can come up with an answer to that question. The really good and interesting thing about the hackathons is it places the industry partner and the academic in an environment where they're not focused on each other. They're actually focused on the student. So they're both trying to help a student overcome a task that they've been set. And they have the chance to look at each other, size each other up, experience each other's kind of demeanor and the way that they would approach things, the way that they would describe things, the level of details that they work in and that kind of stuff. So the hackathons actually, to me, do, uh, they're a bit like a petri dish of being able to test a few things, see how your partners react to the things that you do, examine the things that they do and to be able to kind of take a step back and say, we understand the th we understand what's happening, or we don't understand what's happening, or we don't understand the language that's been used, or we don't understand um, what our partners are are kind of driving at. So the student hackathon thing is actually, uh, I think, a a good solid uh, way of, of of getting to know somebody in a in a slightly less uh, kind of uh, not confrontational, but a slightly less kind of pressured environment. Um, a hackathon could be a way of learning about a partner before they become a partner um, through uh, a hackathon, including students. So this is my shot at um, what a new interaction type might look like. So I'm going to start off by placing academia and industry in the same container, in, and that container is called constraints. So no matter what we do, no matter what we say or how we think about it, and most of the constraints that I've alluded to will continue to exist for some time. So academia will continue to be constrained by access to finance and, and um, academic peer review and all those kinds of things. Industry will continue to be constrained by time and routes to market and the, those other kind of issues. So we're going to leave academia and industry in this kind of small bucket um, of constraints. So what I'm going to wrap around it is a collaboration advisory board. Now, what I mean by an advisory board, it could be, a, I've chosen that phrase, but you could say a steering group or supervising committee or something. So take all the things that frequently break a collaboration and put them in this collaboration advisory board to then advise the academic and industry partners about how to uh, overcome those issues. So it's a bit like bringing subject matter experts in who are not part of the industry um, partner and not part of the academic partner. So it's a bit like a, th a think tank that's going to look at that collaboration and say, these things typically don't work because of culture and finance and communication. So we're effectively going to write you like a little constitution or, or, a, or a set of rules for your collaboration 
that will address all these problems and they're generated independently so not by the industry partner and not by the academic partner so this would be effectively I guess pre-production so all this stuff gets done long before the project starts long before the collaboration is signed, signed and sealed and all the de-risking that will go goes on to make sure that the collaboration is not suffering or subject to some of the well well known well documented problems so that would take us into the project phase so uh, collaboration advisory board is basically pre-production then we've got an advisory board because the project or the collaboration is actually live so the, the academic partner and the industry partner are now fully engaged with each other in terms of trying to de develop and deliver something so the advisory board changes in nature it's now some of the same functions like finance but we bring in project management stakeholder management legal regulatory because they're the next necessary set of reasons why projects will fail so hopefully we've taken the risk out of the collaboration in phase one to a kind of 60 70 percent level now we're going to take another chunk of the risk out by having this advisory board in stage two uh, for, for the the main duration of the project um, so that's our second phase and then as we get towards the end um, so there would be a defined end point so we know when the project is finished it's either because an outcome has been achieved a pattern's been created or something like that or actually we just reached a, a certain point in time so then the commercialization advisory board would kick in uh, to then look at the implementation of the I, the patents and IP strategy that was done by the collaboration advisory board and all the, all the implications of commercialization and licensing and finance so again the academic and industry partners are not dictating to each other they're not trading blows about how they feel about things it's an independent advisory board that's making those judgment calls uh, and all this would you know be put into a legal framework um, so industry and academic partners would be signing up to, at each individual stage accepting the effectively the rule of the advisory boards in terms of dictating how things will um, will be implemented um, so what I've got is I've got subject matter expertise is used to offset the known issues and failings around these projects that I think I think these things really struggle when industry and academia are left to sort these things out themselves and then fail to do so or fail to want to or whatever whatever phrase you want to use um, I think when it's left to them it's it's weaker than if it's some of these things would be taken to a abstracted to a, th a third party group um, to then sit and kind of advise and guide and dictate how these things might work um, so what I had to do here is that this approach would address two out of the three headaches so the, the main headache of project scope and project delivery would be cured by this uh, but it's at the expense of the project so running the advisory boards is a cost on top of the normal costs of running the project so what I'm saying is I guess that it's better easier would be uh, more acceptable for a project to be on time and on budget and slightly expensive than any other combination so um, it's the triple if you're familiar with project management we call it the triple constraint you can google it and get a, a whole rake of websites to explain how the triple constraint affects projects delivery project and project delivery but I think using my interpretation of the triple constraint I think if these partnerships were on time and on scope and ran the risk of being a little bit more expensive than than we predicted at the beginning that actually would be a very positive endpoint and outcome for that uh, project So I'm going to take a slightly more personal perspective um, as I said earlier I'm likely to be a little bit more partisan towards the industry point of view because effectively I associate with that probably more than I do with the um, academic point of view but I, I have tried to be fair I think um, but I'm sure you'll let me know if, if you think I haven't been so firstly we just need to sort out language in, in the end lots of things that I looked at looked like they were technicalities looked like they were kind of um, cultural problems in the end it's just language it's just how we express something to each other in a way that's meaningful and understandable and, and has full transparency applied to it so from a personal point of view we need um, I wouldn't I'll go as far as being a standard contract but if I look back at things that have happened in other sectors like the uh, the um, 
rental market for property they've spent years with multiple different kind of ways of you being able to rent a property the industry gets together they create something called an ast assured uh, tenancy agreement it's the standard now and all all properties dealt with in the same way that's them getting the taxonomy sorted out and i think there's nothing about that that's beyond uh, academia and industry to come along and say each time we engage with each other these are the rules of engagement these are this is how we talk to each other these are the words that we use and these are the definitions and the meanings we apply to those words i don't think that's a, an unrealistic kind of goal um lack of formalities at the beginning D despite regardless of the fact that it's an academic and industry kind of partnership uh, there are a bunch of things that are you just ubiquitous to pro projects that end well so you know getting that scope thing done sorting out an our chart making sure that everybody knows what they're responsible for how it's going to be delivered when it's going to be delivered and how we know that it's finished and what quality means plan b i still think that there's a lot to be done with that in terms of making these collaborations work um, and, and it's a bit like a football. There's going to have to be a bit of give and take in, within industry and academia. But I think it, any progress that you make at the beginning of the project on any or all of those things, you're in a much better uh, condition to see that project through. So universities, I know universities uh, are better with this now than they've ever been, but they have to keep on this mission about promoting application of what students learn, not theorizing. Um, it, it's going to be a thing, I think, that's just going to get harder and, and heavier in terms of uh, what industry needs. And I think universities, are, I'll accept the fact that they are much, much better than they were even five years ago. But they must continue, I think, to push and promote and develop um, uh, application of knowledge as much as creation and generation and understanding. So. IP, um, I don't understand why, they, I don't actually don't really understand how this ends up being the football that it seems to become, but we need a fix. So we need this um, agenda, IP agenda or IP thesis or whatever word that's most appropriate, but at the start, not at the beginning. So the moment that there is the realization that there's a project on the horizon, then all that just needs fixing so that it never becomes a problem. It was pretty crazy to see how many collaborations have ended up with some kind of bun fight about IP and exploitation and ownership and licensing. Um, some universities better than others. It would occur to me that American universities seem to have got a grip of this a little better. UK universities, not so much. Germany, a little bit, a little bit, a little bit better than here. But to be honest, France looked like the Wild West. So I think there's a bunch, a bunch of things there around IP conflict, and and it's about it's about two things. It's about transparency and it's about fairness. So in all in all essence, in all ways, it's got to be fair, but it's also got to be transparent. And I think industry has to learn a little bit there about not holding certain cards as close to its, its chest as it would like, and trusting that the academic partner will not exercise. Uh, what it's told in any other way than what's previously been agreed. So I think there's a, I think there's some wiggle room and some compromise required, but I think it's it's fixable. So I like this statement from Arup uh, Dasgupta: Industry should be the CEO, while academia should be the CTO. I think that's a very good way of describing it. I, I would fully agree with that to some you know, to a large degree. I think in terms of um, the relationship between these two bodies and the and then the ongoing outward um, projection of that relationship to other third parties I think that's a very good uh, a very good way of summarizing it and I, and I would fully kind of endorse that but then I've, I've included this if you chase two rabbits both will escape because there's, there's a clear uh, a clear need for bigger focus so uh, universities very large uh, kind of very complex organizations so if we take Durham University for example 350 million pound organization that would be in the FTSE 100 if it was a private company um, it has a lot on its mind it has a lot on its radar it has a lot of uh, forces acting on it that it, it 
doesn't necessarily have any control over, particularly with things like government legislation and, and regulation and that kind of thing. But all that could mean that there isn't enough focus to make these um, collaborations work. And I would say that every university really needs these collaborations to work. So it needs to stop chasing two rabbits and it needs to say we will focus on uh, accomplishing, you know, X number of, of partnerships with companies that fall into description B and we will do this on this kind of tempo and really just a bit like a, a bit like a venture capital company do develop a partnership thesis about who they would partner with who they wouldn't partner with what the tempo should be uh, what the decision making criteria look like and then allow um, allow that thesis to be exercised right across the organization and not just by the by the exec team so I've got some suggestions coming towards the end of the presentation now. You'll be glad to hear. You're going to see an awful lot of yellow text, but that's more for you to read. I'm not going to. I'm not going to load them away through it. So pay more attention. Um, I've, I've, I've made this is like the third time I've kind of made the same point. Um, pro project management and and the the uh, environments in which projects are created and launched it just needs more attention. So consistency in people, consistency in process, consistency in thinking, consistency in rationale. Um, it just needs an uplift in attention. Um, it, it's what it's probably probably my number one my number one suggestion in some ways, in the sense that uh, people should be dedicatedly applied to these things, not to do it in the mix of, of having to do other things. Um, so suggestion number one is pay more attention. Um, trying to keep it simple, these things must sound a little bit obvious, but some of the projects that I looked at just got very complicated very quickly. So the team hadn't really got uh, over. Uh, I often think that you know, in a partnership, you need a quick win. You need something small, bite-sized that people, everybody can deliver. That they learn a little bit about each other and they get into the into the winning habit of delivering things on time to everybody's expectations. But it was common to find projects get very, very complicated very quickly. That's actually, I would ha happily tell you, that that's a, a compound effect of the industry partner making it more complicated because of the tempo and the intensity that they operate in. Um, um, complexity did escalate more through the industry partner than through the academic partner. But. Build relationships. The last, you know, these things are a bit like marriages. If you if you only expect to be dating for a couple of weeks, then you'll just date for a couple of weeks. If you expect to date for a couple of weeks and then get married, you probably will. So it's about um, setting your stall out correctly. It's about orientating yourself so that you can be a long term partner. Uh, and of course, you know, subject to change. So you know, um, a, a change of uh, management at the at the university. A change of management in the in the industry partner, a change of regulation, something that changes in the in the business environment or the sector that you're working in. All those things are, of course, possible. But you should set out to, you know, find ways of riding all those changes or accommodating all those changes. And then hopefully the relationship is not fractured every time something in the in the ether kind of changes. So um, I, I would. You know, make that a, a, a strong recommendation is to is to look at how uh, long term relationships that are created, built, and then managed and maintained. So timing, timing is everything. So um, there's a right and a wrong moment to instigate these things. There's a right and a wrong moment to bring an idea to the table. Right and a wrong moment to contemplate adopting a new technology. Um, it, it's just about timing. So, um, and on the basis that, you know, the academic part, particularly for the academic partner, um, the kind of work that they do, it's difficult in terms of timing. So you can't write a schedule that says 9 a.m. have first good idea, 10, 10, 15 have second good idea. So, you know, timing needs to be kind of thought through, but it also needs to be flexible so that it can accommodate uh, the ebb and flow, if you like, of, of the process. Um, but you know, timing. There's there's clearly a, um, a a wrong moment. So looking at some of the um, looking at some of the projects that I looked at, the project looked interesting. The partners looked good, but the the timing looked wrong. So one or both of the partners was in, was in the middle of something. 
uh, transformation or something, and it was just not the right moment to, to glue yourself to something else and expect to uh, not get shaken to death. So I think timing is a is a is a factor. So work hard on the communication model. I've kind of laboured this point a little bit, but I'll I'll say it again. It's really about making sure that there is a uh, fully fledged, agreed, comprehensive uh, set of communications that will drive the project and the uh, and the collaboration. You know, it, work it out to the smallest possible detail that you can, and then stick to it. Um, it, it you can, you, there's no downside as far as I'm concerned with that. So mission and vision. Um, they tend these are mission and vision statements tend to be um, a little, sometimes a little kind of glibly treated. So um, some of the better companies that I work with do have very uh, um, accurate and uh, up to date mission and vision statements. Um, of course, they get adjusted as you go, but I think every collaboration should should have those a bit like if it, it, it was becoming a separate company. Uh, I think the management of the project and everybody involved in the collaboration has to sit around that table and talk about the mission and the vision until they've got a clear, clear, clean, coherent statement that they can make for anybody that wants to know what that what that project or collaboration is about. Um, don't be afraid to stop. So I don't mind the idea that something may naturally grind to a halt because of changes and um, uh, factors outside of the project or the or collaborations control. You know, but you know, it's not failure. It's just how it is, I guess. Uh, celebrate it. You know, have a pie. You, you know, um, if you're gonna if you're gonna combine something to the bin or, or it's not a negative. You've learned a lot. So celebrate these, celebrate these little kind of uh, moments in the project. Celebrate when something goes spectacularly well. Celebrate when you hit a milestone. Celebrate when you ditch something or confine something to the bin as a failure. Just celebrate. Um, and all things come to an end. You know, there should be an exit plan. So again, I've made a couple of references to the way that uh, venture capital companies work. They know how to get into something, but they also know how to get out of something. So they know that something is going to reach a point where it needs to be sold, be closed, be you know all those things are agreed up front. So they have a plan that will show that they are fully aware of what uh, the end of the project will look like, uh, and I don't see why this would be any different. So as much as plan as it, you plan for everything to go well, plan for everything to not go well. What will bring the bring the whole thing to a, to a conclusion? How will the divorce work? Um, all that kind of stuff. So, in, in a lot of instances, the projects projects I looked at kind of came to a little bit of a halt, but nobody really had an idea about what to do next. And that's because there was no exit plan, or there was no uh, plan B, or there was no this is how we divorce from each other because we've reached a point where it, it the project can't continue. So I'm going to quickly highlight. A couple of the case studies that I looked at that I thought were a little more interesting. So Wichita State University um, have been working with Net, uh, Airbus and NetApp. Um, it's probably quite a good reflection of what I think could or should happen on a lot of university campuses. Um, it's not a difficult thing to contemplate. You, there was clearly a good set of reasons for uh, Airbus and NetApp to do what they were doing with Wichita. Uh, the link is there if you want to read a little bit more about uh, the details. Um, so Boeing working with the University of Cambridge, uh, again, pretty much uh, the kind of model, I think, that or the kind of uh, relationship that works really well. Um, so I've had a little bit of exposure to Boeing, so I know and understand the level of detail that they work in around these things. Um, so not a surprise that they've got a fully fledged kind of program of working with, uh, with universities. Um, what you might notice is that some sectors have got a longer standing understanding of how these things work. It, the aviation sector has clearly battened down the hatches with this. It knows it needs universities, and it's worked hard on a framework that it can use to engage universities. And I think that's a uh, that's a solid set of principles. Um, but the Boeing University of Cambridge collaboration around hydroelectric airplane development was just intriguing, just a very interesting thing to read. And then scientists at the University of Warwick. 
uh, working with Rolls Royce. So again, Rolls Royce connected to the aviation sector through um, the development of jet engines, but clearly a company that has decided to um, work at a higher level with universities, then worked out an engagement model that they think works, and then they've exercised that model and brought in a number of universities on a number of different levels um, to show that they can actually, that can actually, for them, that is a viable option and it can actually work. That's the end of the presentation. Thanks for listening. Thanks, Dave. Um, a very thorough, inter in interesting presentation. Um, does anybody have any questions? I know we've gone over time, but I'm sure everybody will be able to take away something, and certainly when this goes up on YouTube as well. Um, Sharif, uh, Helen, Gaynor, do you have any questions? Hello, I have a question, uh, Hannah. It's about the conflict. Um, is there anything we could do beforehand to minimize the conflict, like you suggested, David, that uh, communication protocol or um, some kind of communication thesis before we actually embark on uh, any project? Is there anything we could do to say, look, if con conflict happened, that's the way we're going to manage. Is there anything we can do about it so beforehand? There's, yeah, there's, there's two things that occur to me. One is that I actually really do believe that universities need uh, a partnership thesis. So they need to go and look at all options, all opportunities, and they need to rule some things out. I think where you get conflict is where there's a mismatch in ideology and thinking and approach and attitude. So as I've said there with, on the slides, the aviation sector clearly likes the idea of working with universities. They do a lot of it and they've come up with a way of doing it which is meaningful for them and is acceptable for the university. So effectively, uh, Rolls-Royce, Boeing have probably got a partnership strategy or a partnership thesis that, all, the, that the whole company subscribes to, and that probably keeps them away from some of the companies. It probably stops them out of hand dealing with certain companies of certain types. Now, so, okay, so you create a small limitation for yourself if you rule some companies out, but you give your partnerships that you do enter a much higher chance of success. Um, the other thing that, that kind of reinforces that is that there are um, pe people that I meet that are clearly much more um, emotionally intelligent uh, in lots of ways. I, I wouldn't I, I wouldn't necessarily use that or describe me as that, but I've, I can see people in my environment very carefully taking stock of people's reactions and body language and uh, the tone of the voice and whether they're looking down or looking up on, and all that kind of stuff. I think those people are few and far between, and I think they, there has to be some element of that brought into the mix. So I think things only get really difficult when people don't realize that things are getting really difficult. Does that make sense? Yes. So I've sat through a couple of meetings where I've started to get really uncomfortable, and I'm waiting for somebody else to say something mm. because I'm feeling uncomfortable about what's being said, and then nobody says anything. So I leave the meeting wondering whether it was just me or whether everybody else was feeling the same way as me and just didn't want to say anything. And I think it's those kind of things that are underestimated and become the seeding of potential disagreement. And it really just takes somebody to break ranks and say, right, hang on a minute, this conversation is not going the way we thought. There's a couple of things that have come up from you. There's a couple of things that we need to put forward. I think it's just taking the sting out of it and bringing it onto the table in a, in a, in a positive way and mm -hmm. saying before, the, before anybody else gets any more uncomfortable about what's going on, we should, we should try and get to the bottom of it. But, you know, I've been to lots of meetings inside of universities where it's very polite and it's very non-confrontational and it's very, there's lots of hesitation about bringing up problems and issues. And I think, um, that, that somehow needs to be managed in the mix. I think some, somewhere in the project initiation, somebody needs to come in with a bit of that point of view or, or that remit and a bit of emotional intelligence and try and de detect or work out whether any of those underlying factors are, are actually there, right? Okay. So, David, what, what you are David, you're saying is actually try to get, uh, basically, it's a nip in the bud. So, if you actually... Um, feel or think something is not going okay straight away you you actually tackle it rather than actually leave things yeah 
I, yeah. and, and I, 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 I subscribe to that, and I also understand how different that is in the university mm. context. So I, I've worked in private companies where we've had what we call a no-blame culture, where anybody can say anything and nobody's going to get into trouble for it. Mm. And the last, the last couple of companies that I've owned and run, I've tried to have that. Like, I, you know, if I'm about to do something stupid and the receptionist thinks I'm about to do something stupid, she should stop me. And I'm not going to criticise her for it. She's just going to try and stop me from doing something stupid. Um, so I think uh, that kind of um, that kind of uh, safety valve of being able to say to everybody, anybody on the project saying, I don't care whether you're, you know, uh, a professor or whether you 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 joined two weeks ago, it there can't be we can't have a um, a culture of of silence if you like about things that just don't sound right or things that don't feel right. I think I think that just ends up being a longer term problem that you end up that either brings your project to a conclusion or it it makes the project more painful. Uh, I used to use this phrase when with games developers. I used to say everything that troubles us in the end is everything that we didn't deal with at the beginning. So that, that, that idea of pre-production, that mm. idea of having a stage before we do anything, and the only thing we're concerned about is the things that we don't know, not the things that we do know. Mm. Um, that, ha that I would say that has saved me on a couple of projects where I've, I've actually managed to de-risk it, de-risk a project uh, to a level where when I've got into production, I've got very little to worry about. Um, but that's an un that would be an uncommon that would be an uncommon kind of um, step if you like in most collaborations and most projects, and I think it's it, now that I've started looking at it and thinking about it, I think it's kind of necessary that you just don't glue yourself to to a commitment and to an, an another organisation where you just know where you just don't know what you don't know and 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 without having to de risk without de risking it to the nth degree. Uh, it just looks like you're know, gambling, right? Some of these partnerships could be millions of dollars or millions of pounds. Mm -hmm. So if you just don't do the hard work up front and you don't do the heavy lifting and you don't keep it simple and you don't pay attention, then you're going to end up with long-term issues through that project. So it's probably a good idea if we actually thrust things out at the beginning before we embark on any project. Um, Tackle yes. everything from there. So, so I, I think I like the idea of what you said, actually, no blaming culture. I mean, I came from social work, social services, whereby we always say no blame culture, but at the end of the day, we scapegoat people. So yeah. if we really honestly say no blame culture in a project uh, uh, and do that way and we actually behave that manner, then probably yeah. uh, it will make things easier it's, and people will become more honest and transparent. Yeah, if somebody can see the problem with something, or somebody can see the way to improve something, why would you not want them to speak? That mm. I, that that, mm. that I will not understand. So I have been in meetings where somebody's been shouted down a little bit purely because they're a junior person in the room, but actually what they're saying was reasonably quite valid. Uh, I've had that, I've, I've experienced that, and I just don't understand it. I think everybody that's going to commit to a project needs to commit to it with you know fully and and know that that. that on any day, they can say, "Hey, wh why are we doing this?" and then not be shouted down for it. It's a, if it's a genuine request for information or a genuine concern or a genuine question, then mm. you know that's kind of what you want the whole team or the whole collaboration to be about, not sitting around in silence, saying, "Thinking, well, you know, this is going to go wrong, but uh, you know, I'm not going to say anything. I just just, just don't understand that." Okay, thank you very much. Just the last one. Um, you, you talked about this a communication thesis or some kind of protocol. Is there any example anywhere that I could actually go and have a look at it, how they actually – I know it's going to be different for different projects, but is there any example or any website you could suggest that I can go and have a look at it? There wasn't anything that I, there wasn't anything that I would have said was a complete or comprehensive mm. thing. I mean, I – uh, in the statements, in the in the yellow text that I put in on those uh, suggestions, you know, I think um, if I just go back, just to remind myself what I wrote. Um, uh, I found it now. Yeah, so if you're aware on point five, where I've put work hard, very hard on communication model. Mm. So at the and the in the bottom of that I've put you know project management meetings on a Monday by Skype requiring a quorum creative meetings on a Tuesday with everyone physically present finance meeting on a Wednesday Wednesday, which is accumulation of written reports by the CEO and then a one to one with the FT. I think that they are almost like common sense statements, 
you don't want to be tackling multiple subjects on the same day. That becomes mm -hmm. too intense. You want to keep the meetings uh, productive, so you need to decide what that meeting is for, who needs to be who needs to be there, and you know that kind of thing. I think as much as um, as much as anything, it's just a, a, a common sense kind of rationale applied to what might happen over the course of a week in terms of meetings, right? Um, I mean, I tend to run meetings like that, so I tend to have short meetings frequently around single subjects with the minimum number of people involved. That's my kind of preference, rather than having meetings with 20 people involved that last three hours and trying to cover multiple subjects. I kind of don't don't like that, or I don't subscribe to that. Um, but I think if you sit, I think with all these things, you you sit and say, okay, what actually makes sense? You know, if if all the people are in the office on Monday. Which meetings can be held on a Monday? If people are working remotely the rest of the week, how do I position my meetings so that I'm always going to get the information that I want in the format that I need it in? Um, like you said, projects vary, so you know it's going to be different every time you do it. But I think it's just more of a, a kind of common sense rationale applied to a meeting strategy. The, you know, the thing you need to be afraid of is uh, a meeting that just doesn't seem to have an outcome. So, you know, I, I've been to meetings where the only thing I know at the end of it is the time and the day of the next meeting. That, that, that meeting's pointless. Right? We haven't achieved anything. So I think uh, if you use your own perspective and you use your own uh, rationale and, and apply some common sense to it, I think you'll end up with less meetings, or you'll probably end up with more meetings that take less time but have better outcomes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Dave, um, and I'm sure if it's okay with you, um, if any of our uh, colleagues wish to contact you directly or even through the yeah. PRA, is that okay or via Twitter? Yeah. yeah, of course it is. That's great, thank you. Um, I'm going to thank you again, and um, this will be going up onto YouTube in the next um, one to two days. Yeah. Thank you. Well, thank, thank you very much. It was it was it was a fairly it was a fairly fun thing to do